So my guest for tonight, Olivia. You can find out more about Olivia by typing exclamation mark Olivia. Um, Olivia is a uh, a PhD working in quantum computing. I'm very excited about this. I I don't know if I told you this, Olivia. I probably did not. But I recently switched from astro particle into quantum field theory and quantum computing. Oh, I did not know that. I'm very I'm very I'm lost. Condensed matter physics is crazy. Like I I don't I don't I literally took the entire spring semester, which was like the first semester of me doing this, and just took in a class called Advanced Condensed Matter. And the class was literally catered towards me, only student. And I spent the entire time just trying to understand the things that were in condensed matter. Your yeah. your your field is rich with words. <laughs> words that I didn't understand and still don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I think that condensed matter is a totally different subject than quantum in my opinion. Like, oh, really? obviously, yeah, they, there are some universities now who have like quantum computing and like quantum information is like their own sort of, um, you know, subject like astro and particle yeah. physics. They also have like quantum information now because like, I don't know, some of the overlap between condensed matter makes sense but some of it doesn't and um, condensed matter is hard <laughs> um, <laughs> condensed matter is hard <laughs> condensed matter is like really hard i don't remember a whole lot from those classes <laughs> um yeah so i'm i'm very excited about this conversation i've been uh i've been uh, working with quantum computers on and off for like a year and a half maybe but like i haven't had like a lot of depth in quantum computers for the, until like the last six months so i'm very excited about this conversation um Let's do a couple uh, of housekeeping things for those of you in chat right now. A couple announcements uh, for this week specifically. Tomorrow is our physics game show. The theme is special relativity. So if you would like to come play along, uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. we'll go live. I think, so Olivia, what I've been doing now is uh, I've been like doing a discussion series where I learn and then teach quantum computing to the chat. Uh, on Wednesdays, so it's like you know, you know, read through. Actually, read through this gem. The Bible. You know, mm -hmm. The Bible. Yes. <laughs> read the Bible, and then like uh, take a bunch of notes, and then present it uh, to you know the community. And uh, very good feedback so far from them, and it's helped me learn a ton of quantum computing in a very short time. So no, that's um, great. That's been helpful. Uh, but we're gonna be doing that tomorrow, and then after that, we'll be doing our game show on Thursday. Thursday is our normal study stream in the morning, but we're also having a special study stream on Thursday night, or not study stream, thir a special stream on Thursday night where we're going to be like testing our fireworks and op and camera settings and everything like that for Sunday because Sunday is our fireworks and cooking stream. So um, this should be a lot of of we have a lot a busy couple days in the in the near future. So I, I invite you all to come and hang out with me for that. Um, but tonight tonight is is is. Tonight is the night where we learn about Olivia. We find all sorts of, of good things about the scientist that Olivia is and uh, her work in uh, quantum computing, quantum information. Uh, and so that's what we'll do soon. But uh, really quick, one more announcement. We'll be doing a Q&A with Olivia in uh, probably about an hour, hour and a half. And if you would like to, you may ask a question the following way. Type exclamation mark ask followed by the question. And uh, that will go into a separate window while I will have access to it so that I can ask uh, Olivia when the time comes. So feel free to ask whenever. And if you ask that way, <laughs> then I will continue. To, then I'll, I'll have that question <laughs> on the screen. Uh, and mods, if you're around, if you could see any questions, or even if you have been around for a while and know the, the, the drill, commentator, and tropical, uh, then you can grab the questions, throw them, and ask for me. That would be helpful if, I, if you see that I don't get it. But nevertheless... Um, I think if I think we could just hop right into the uh, the the conversation, Olivia. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so now, <laughs> one thing that I really like to ask my guests when they come on is what their um, what their childhood education was like. Like, what were so for you? What was it like when you were in elementary school and middle school, especially elementary middle school? Were you like very much into math and science at the time? Yeah. So um, in elementary school. I was definitely into math and science. I mean, I was sort of one of those kids that was like always outside, like always exploring. Um, there was this really big, 
pond in my yard on my parents' property. And I basically like lived next to that thing. Like I was always <laughs> like catching fish and tadpoles. Like I was, you know, a total tomboy for a really long time. Um, and I, so I always kind of thought I would be a biologist because um, I was always really interested in like animals and nature and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I was always pretty good at math. I think I went into high school and I was like originally, you know, signed up to do all honors and AP classes and it wasn't really hard for me at that point. Um, and then when I was finally starting to do like honors and AP courses, I sort of like <laughs> realized that I had to try for the first time. <laughs> um, I don't mean to like, you know, pat myself on the back like, oh, I'm so smart. It was no, just please like, do. I just never really had to study to like do good enough. Like I wasn't a straight A student. I just uh -huh. like did good enough all the time. Like my parents were like, oh, we want you to do, you know, we want you to get like all A minuses at least this semester. And I was like, okay, sure, fine. So I did like the bare minimum required to like get what was expected of me <laughs> um, <laughs> for a really long time. And so I never really learned how to study very well. Um, from this sort of uh, very faulty method. That I <laughs> so yeah, up until high school, I was always interested in math and science. And then it became obvious, I think, to my teachers that like I wasn't working very much at all. Like I was really doing the bare minimum and my teachers became pretty frustrated with me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe they knew I was smart and I was just like not living up to my potential or whatever, or maybe they just thought I was annoying. I'm not sure. Um, but at that point I was like, yeah, uh, I kind of want to get into college and my GPA was <laughs> bad at that point because like, like it was pretty bad. <laughs> um, so at that point I was like, oh, I gotta turn it around cause I kind of want to go to college and like, originally I wanted to be a biologist. So I know that that's not going to be like the easiest major in the world. Um, and right around that point, yeah, I started trying. <laughs> <laughs> and um it was you know a, a steep learning curve because i actually had to do homework when i went home and not just you know i i was into like all different sorts of like clubs and activities so it was like a lot less fun time for me and more actual work um and right around that time i was taking physics and biology and i was like oh i'm like really much better at this physics thing <laughs> Than the bio thing and there was a lot of like, <laughs> dissection going on and i was like oh so bio is like a lot of dead stuff um <laughs> formaldehyde <laughs> yeah That's i don't know why like you know that never really occurred to me um but when i realized there was a lot of formaldehyde and a lot of working with dead things i was way less into it <laughs> <laughs> well there's a big um, difference i grew up on i grew up in a pond like uh, like with a pond on my property too and oh, there's yeah. such a big difference from like playing with nature and like seeing it and interacting with it and then yeah. just like slicing it open and taking a look at the inside and it's like this oh i hated it i really like i took it in college too i remember dissecting a you know a fetal pig and just being like nope i'm done i can't do this anymore i like things that are not dead so <laughs> right it's so yeah i think that was better. like a really long rant i think i sort of answered your question there was a period where oh, i was yeah, really yeah. into it and then not <laughs> into it and then into it again now you went to college in in, uh, in PA. Are you originally from PA? No, I'm from Boston originally, and then oh, my okay. family moved to Connecticut, and then I was in Pennsylvania for the past decade for school. Oh, I see. Cool. Um, yeah, but the, I mean, so that's but that's awesome. So like outdoorsy nature, um, and then also, I mean, I think that that kind of goes hand in hand with like a love of science, especially at a young age. Like my like my kids love that stuff. They love like catching frogs and looking at fish and doing all this stuff so it's and it goes and then they do well in science class like i think those things go yeah, perfectly i mean i think it was just like a natural curiosity you know um yeah. and i really liked the animals so yeah i mean i think my love of animals is really why i'm not a biologist because i couldn't handle them being dead <laughs> <laughs> uh tropical geek says it was a good rant so uh approve uh, definitely approval on that um <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, and i concur definitely uh did you have any like major influences in your life when you were growing up like did was there like specific teachers or were you into like maybe a book series or anything that or even you like probably... a science communicator 
yeah, I mean, you probably hear this all the time, but mm -hmm. Carl Sagan was really my first window into physics and astronomy. And I guess I would say my bigger influence was probably my dad. Um, my, my parents are both scientists. Um, they work in health science, but my dad has always been really into physics and he gave me the original Cosmos DVD set when I was maybe a sophomore or a junior in high school, right around when I was taking physics for the first time. And I watched it and I was just like, oh my God, this is mind blowing. Like these, this is the person asking like the big questions that I've always, you know, wondered about and that you tend to think about when you're a teenager that you can't really go to and ask in school, like, where do we come from? You know, why are we here? Those sorts of things. And I had never heard somebody vocalize these questions out loud before. And so I was like, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an astronomer. That's it. Like, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, go to school and major in astronomy and I'm going to be the next Carl Sagan. Um, so, yeah, he was really the one who, who first got me into it. And of course, That's I'm not awesome. an astronomer now. Um. <laughs> I feel like that kind of like is a common thing though. Like people like, so there's like the hook, the hook, you know, side commers who like talk yeah. about all like the crazy, like awesome giant ginormous thing. And then you study it and you're like, this is actually pretty cool. I want to go here instead. <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, I mean, I did astronomy. I majored in astronomy as well as physics when I went to, when I went to college. Nice. And I was planning on going to graduate school for astrophysics for like the longest period of time until like my senior year, I went an observing run and I was like, oh, I don't love this, <laughs> but I this plan, so I guess I'm just going to do it anyways, even though I don't really <laughs> like it, but like that was always the plan, so better stick with the plan. Um, and then I sort of found quantum by accident in that period of time and I was like, oh, this is way more fun <laughs> me anyway i had uh i had kyle cabasares on an uh an astronomer and uh he was he was one of the first guests i had on and i asked him you know and he said that like sometimes he has to prepare like date like a couple days in the head to do runs and stuff and other times he just wings it he says now that he's like you know third fourth year in graduate school it's like almost a necessity that you, he has to like prepare his sleep schedule <laughs> to actually have like a successful start, like run, you know, even though it's only going to be for like yeah. one or maybe two nights, maybe um, it's like crazy to me how much of a commitment it is just to get data. Um, I am like, so not a night owl. And so, yeah, when we were uh, going to start taking data at like five o'clock at night and, you know, taking data all, all night and going to sleep at like 11 in the morning, I was like, this is not my life. <laughs> um, can't do it <laughs> it's like when you grow up in the rural areas though like you just love to look up at night and just see all the stars and everything like that and it's like i still like doing that it's oh just i like, know that's not what astronomy is. <laughs> I know. it's so different it's like oh man i did the same thing like growing up in the sticks i love to look up at night and see the sky and then now that i've seen astronomers work i'm 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 like, it's so much less fun than they make it. Good sound. for you. <laughs> it's good really just you. like a lot of this. I'm like, I know. Programming. And I was like, oh, it's not that fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. Uh, okay. So I, I am kind of curious and I usually ask people this, what, what like extracurriculars did you do? Were you, were you into sports a lot or music? I did a little bit of everything, to be honest. I played uh, in the jazz band, in the marching band. I played trombone. Um, if anyone's curious about the specifics, um, awesome. <laughs> I, what were the other things you said? Sports. I was on the swim team, but I was really pretty bad, <laughs> but I was still on the swim team. That, um, yeah. They let that's, me show up and that's like, all that know, counts. Flash around, but I'm not very good. Um, <laughs> and I was also, one thing I was really good at is I was on the debate team at my high school and oh, nice. I was like so super passionate about that like I was state ranked at one point like I was so competitive I was so into it that was like my thing that like Dang. I was best at like I remember we had this like our valedictorian was like the smartest person I've ever met you know she did worldwide competitions and like physics math chemistry like the most brilliant person ever and I beat her at a debate tournament once and I was just <laughs> I'm I am now better. <laughs> yeah. For um, 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, do you remember like the most like enjoyable or maybe passionate? I don't I don't know if those are the same thing. Um but uh like the topic of debate that you did? Um, what did we do? 
I don't remember any of the topics, really. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can believe that. Um, like, it was never, it was one of those, I forget what the style of the debate is, but it's one of those ones where you don't prepare in advance and you don't know the topic. You just walk oh, into okay. a room and they tell you the topic and they hand you, like, a few articles and that's the only information you're allowed to use. Wow. What so, if you, like, vehemently disagree with it? You have to do both sides. You have to argue both sides. Oh, wow. Over the okay. course of the day. So... Um, I don't remember the topics because I didn't feel passionately really about any of them, or at least I couldn't in the moment. <laughs> I know. So um, like, you were just like stone cold, like you just yeah. laid down the facts and like, let people have it. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I was really very good at it. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my favorite sort of extracurricular activity. Um, what do I do now as an extracurricular activity? Um, I paint a little bit. I take pictures now. I'm a little bit into photography. Oh, awesome. Um, I have a dog, so I like I hang out with my dog. If that's a, if that's a hobby, <laughs> that's a hobby. I have I have chickens. I hang out with them. Oh, like, that's cool. M several times a day, I hang out with my chickens. Um, that's neat. They're lively. They're like they have characters, and I don't understand it yet. But they have characters. They're young still. <laughs> We're new chicken owners. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but they're lively. Um, so it's and I have Darla. Darla, I I, I Darla's my puppers. Uh, I've had her for seven years six years so she's she's yeah. uh she's more than lively um my dog is like at my feet right now Maybe she, she heard <laughs> she yeah. knew she's like you she called <laughs> um so but that's cool i i have a feeling like i know i have a lot of my guests uh and myself included like heavily into music and it's um i i just feel like that that's like for me and i i was talking to uh I was talking to my last guest about this, that like, there is this, um, like it's when you're passionate about science and stuff, like I always wanted to have that creative outlet that wasn't so obvious in the sciences. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's not like a hugely obvious creative outlet. So I've always kind of noticed this like correlation that like people who are, especially younger, who are into physics and math. Cause my, my like breakout for physics and math was like junior year in high school. Like that was when I really took off. And I was very passionate about other things like science and like, I just loved math when I was young, young, and there's not a lot of creative outlets for students. So like my thing was to turn to music and I'm noticing that correlation a lot as well. Um, but yeah, so that's cool to see that you played trombone. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I played the oboe. So Ooh, little, little different, one. little different, <laughs> I guess <laughs> I couldn't be in a marching band, not with that thing. Um, but it was a lot of fun anyways. Um, so that's cool. I, I, I love that. Um, but let's, I mean, I kind of want to talk about your undergraduate a little bit. Where did you go to undergraduate, uh, undergraduate yeah, school? Yeah, I went to a really small school. I went to a school called Dickinson College, mm -hmm. um, which is near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I went there because they have an observatory on campus and a telescope. Um, so I thought I wanted to, you know, major in astronomy. So I was like, oh, I want to go to like sort of a smaller school. I want to major in astronomy. This was like the only one that sort of offered that in the sort of nearby-ish region. Cool. Um, how, like, what was your under experience, undergraduate experience like? Was it, because it's a small school, sometimes the pro, the physics programs are like less like linear than like a big school would be. Mm -hmm. um, what was your physics like curriculum like at the small, at small school? So physics was like one of their things that they like oh, specialized in that's um, cool so they had so the american journal of physics editor was actually my advisor in undergrad um so he was like pretty well known he's like one of the best communicators best teachers i've ever had like absolutely brilliant guy brilliant at teaching um his name is david jackson but not david jackson of the terrible oh <laughs> not not that david, david not that, um David. <laughs> but, or he says that at least yeah <laughs> uh so like the intro classes are pretty much the same, you know, there's lab, they do lab at the same time as the lecture, although it's not, you know, that different. I think it really only became different in like the upper level courses because um, they only had, you know, between like eight and 12 majors a year or something like that. So they didn't offer every course every semester. So that was a little bit hard because I could only take one advanced course every semester. So like when I was applying oh, wow. to graduate school, um, and I was taking like the physics theory. I hadn't taken E and M or thermo yet when I wow. took the physics theory. So that was like the only real downside is that like I was applying to graduate school 
and you know taking this competitive exam and i didn't have my catholic glasses that i really needed to take the exam. that's rough <laughs> um yeah and i mean i guess you know i could have taught it to myself but i, I don't know i mean i was uh 20 years old i didn't really have the foresight sure. but <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure sure <clears throat> um, the major that's cool. in of itself was still i mean the teachers were were amazing Oh, that's good. I mean, like, sometimes you hear about the small schools, and, like, that's the biggest complaint is, like, there's, you know, way too many students to the teachers. The teachers don't really know a lot because they're not, like, I mean, like, some small schools will just hire teachers, not, like, physicists, you know? So no, it's just, they were, like, like, very big on doing research. It was a very good small school. Like, they had tiny classes, no more than, like, 10 people. Oh, know, wow. Class, cool. I think I, I think I took a math class with, like, four people in it, which was pretty cool. For undergraduate, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, so though. Kind super of specialized. Mm -hmm. Um, so you did research. You said your advisor was. Uh, you had an advisor when you were an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. So you did research. What was your research in? So I did sort of a laser optics experiment. Um, okay. my senior year. What happened is that I did two RUs. Um, I did an RU in biophysics just because I thought it sounded fun and I got in. Um, and I was like, nope, definitely biophysics, bio. We're done with that. We tried it. It's not for me. And yeah. then I did an RU in astrophysics, and I was like, not for me. Running out of options here. You know, I always wanted to go to graduate school, and I was like, well, what am I going to study for six years? That's not going to make me hate my life. Um, and I remembered that uh, my advisor in one of my intro courses did this cool sort of demonstration of, you know, the double slit experiment that everyone sort of familiar yeah. with where you can create cool interference patterns of light, even though you only have like one quantum particle or whatever passing through the slits. And I thought that was so cool and that was mind blowing. So I approached him and I was like, hey, let me do research with you because I'm super into this stuff and I'm running out of options here yeah. <laughs> about like what topics I might want to do in graduate school. And he was like, uh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Very reluctant, uh, yes. <laughs> he, well, he was so busy. It wasn't yeah. like his fault. He was just like, he was the editor and he was like, I have a lot going on. And I was like, please let me do raise your review. Um, <laughs> and he was like, all right, but you have to like set it up yourself. Like you have to build the experiment. So I did um, this cool experiment called um, ghost interference and diffraction. It's uh -huh. basically like a variation of the double slit thing um, my senior year. I see. So a lot of lasers and aligning mirrors and that kind of stuff. I see. Cool. Um, yeah, there's uh, we. I my, one of my good friends is in an optics lab, and they have um, they have the most tedious job. <laughs> now he's really good it's at it. Super super <laughs> tedious. So yeah. like the physics, um, as you probably know, isn't super different than quantum computing. Yeah. Um, but the tediousness. Is that a word? Tediousness. Te tediosity. Okay. Yeah, tediosity. tediosity. <laughs> it was very tedious. Um, and I spent many hours aligning mirrors and laser beams. And I was just like, man, this is annoying. <laughs> but I really liked the physics. And right, I, I right. knew sort of at that point that like I wanted to be an experimentalist. And I was, my advisor always said, he was like, you're stubborn enough to be an experimentalist. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. <laughs> I guess. It's 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 awesome because like okay so let me do a little so if you are just joining us now um, I guess Olivia Lanes is a uh, PhD in uh, super conductivity quantum information which I'm gonna figure out what that means later but in the meantime I uh, I do know that right now she's a comp uh, quantum computer specialist at IBM and uh, an educator and it's uh, so it's my my absolute pleasure to have Olivia on the show tonight uh, we will be doing questions so you can ask a question uh, exclamation mark ask followed by your question. Uh, and it will go into a separate queue where I can see it later, and we'll do a formal Q and A um, in a little while. Um, but I, uh, there was a question that I had, <laughs> and and it's gone. Um, so I guess let me just ask you another question. What is? Uh, how do you feel like your? How important do you feel your undergraduate research was for getting into graduate school? I mean, it's really hard to say. Um, I think people really like to see that you have research on your resume. Like, I feel like I probably wouldn't have gotten into graduate school without having, you know, those sort of boxes that you can tick and be like, well, at least she's done research. Um, but like, did it help me make my choice along the way? And like what I was going to research, it helped me figure out, I guess, like what I didn't want to do. Um, but it didn't <laughs> help me 
find quantum computing exactly because right. they didn't have quantum computing. I mean, maybe they had it at that time, but not very prevalently and certainly not at really tiny colleges. Sure. Um, yeah, that was my next question is, did they have quantum computing? Because I was kind of curious about no, that. I don't think very many schools had quantum computing research at that time and certainly not tiny ones with 2,500 yeah. people. That's that's uh, it's definitely true about that. Uh, yeah, because I mean, quantum computing, it, it's still relatively new as far as like um, the popularity of it. Uh, yeah. The especially for graduate students and undergraduate, it felt kind of untouchable for grad students for a while. But uh, yeah. I think the um, the thing I was going to say that I forgot about was were, were you doing exper So you were doing were you strictly doing experiments during undergraduate or did you do some theory work as well? Yeah, I never really did a lot of theory work. I pretty much just was interested in the observation in astronomy mm -hmm. and the experimentation in the optics lab. I didn't ever, yeah, I never really did a lot of theory. I didn't really take a lot of math, if I'm being honest. Oh, okay. I like, <laughs> I like fulfilled like my math quota, like the minimum number of math classes that I had to take. And, uh, and then I was like, all right, well, I'm done, <laughs> I guess, right? I don't know, for some reason, like, I really wish I didn't do that, but for some reason at the time, I just like wasn't into math classes. Like I liked math, but I like I thought the classes were not interesting. I don't know why. The, well, um, I did the same thing with labs. I did the op I did labs that way. I I did the intro labs. Yeah. And then you're supposed to do like a sophomore and a junior and like a senior lab or whatever, or an advanced lab or something like that. I just skipped all of those. I was just like I, mean, I just did math classes instead of those. Yeah, I feel like undergraduate labs just are so sterile, and I don't really know. I mean, some you can take away some information, but right. like so many times you just are like, all right, the ball rolls down the ramp, and I <laughs> went but five you, meters. Okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to gain from this. <laughs> you say that as an experimentalist, though, but like I, when I was before I started working in quantum computing, I I uh, I like would dabble in some of the quantum information stuff like what you know you know basically just like bits moving through gates what the gates do and, and blah 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 like i did that in my uh our like uh my graduate quantum class the second class for my graduate school um was dedicated to doing quantum computing stuff for the most part because the um my current advisor was that lecturer and he was he was uh he wanted us to have something that was more like up to date so that's what we wanted to do and uh and for me, I was just sort of like, okay, this is cool. Like, you know, it's just applying operators to states and, you know, it's quantum mechanics in, in a nutshell and, and, and whatnot. And I thought that's kind of cool. And I had like a lot of time thinking about it, fun thought experiments and stuff like that. Now I go and I w join this group that's doing a quantum, they want to, you know, we're like, you know, looking at quantum computers, but like physical quantum computers. And I'm sitting there thinking like, how the hell does anyone build this? Like, how do you actually take this object and make it real? Like, to me, it's like, oh, just apply some operators to some states. And then they're like, yeah, you got a super cool it, potential wells, and the potential well will open up, and the electron will just fly around and do all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Wait, this yeah. is real? It's, like, pretty hard to make a quantum computer. <laughs> it's pretty challenging. <laughs> so that's a great quote. Yeah, it's pretty hard. <laughs> um, Olivia Lane, it's, it's pretty hard. <laughs> it's pretty hard. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Um, I want to know more about the transition uh, from, you know, your the, the two different fields of experimentation. Um, but maybe first about that, before we get into that, I kind of want to know, do you have any, like, under, un, uh, undergrad regrets? Under re undergrads. Do you have any undergrad regrets? <laughs> undergrads, yeah. I mean, I wish I took more math classes. I don't know why. I thought it would be fine to just like stop at calculus and be like, well, I'll learn the lesson <laughs> like, while I'm doing it. Like, That's I remember wild. It, it was wild. I remember I got into graduate school and they're like, all right, so, you know, complex numbers and like complex analysis. And I was just like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> especially those are like those classes I skipped. <laughs> yeah, especially like no linear algebra. Like, I mean, I, I like linear algebra. I was always okay with because I okay. thought I taught enough of that in <laughs> quantum mechanics class that like I was always That's okay true. with yeah. linear algebra. But nobody ever bothered to teach me complex or real analysis. <laughs> yeah, and, and those they they come big. They come big, especially towards like the the they um, go in more hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, at the end and also PDEs, partial differential equations. Yeah, yeah, never yeah. saw any of that. So um, my regret is not taking more math. And again, like I was sort of in this phase where like, 
I was really, you know, into my friends and into my extracurriculars. And I was always like, uh, you know, into my studies as well, but I was never really trying that hard. Like I didn't have to really push myself to get, again, grades that I deemed acceptable. I was not right. a 4 student, but my grades were always good. And I was like, well, these are good enough to get into graduate school. So <laughs> nice. now I can go out and hang with my friends and like go to the bar. Um, well, and... I mean, like how much do you like, it, no, it, that, to me, that makes sense. That's called optimization. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what a lot of people say. And like, I guess I don't regret it like too much because it ended up okay. And like, you know, in some ways I got lucky and I got into good graduate school and I found a good advisor, but it could have easily not been that way. And so I probably, you know, <laughs> should have developed better study habits in undergrad. Um, one thing that like I say is was always a mistake is that I was a student who I think I was like sort of insecure mm -hmm. about like my intelligence and about belonging in those classes. And even though I always did fine on tests and homework and stuff, if I read a problem and I didn't know how to do it, like when I was doing homework, I would immediately ask a friend or, you know, Google it and see if there was a similar problem online or go to office hours and be like, I'm stuck. Even though I wasn't really stuck, I just like didn't really like attempt it. I didn't give it like, you know, the old college try or whatever, as they would say. Mm -hmm. I just assumed like, oh, I'm too confused to figure this out. I need help. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't do that. Like no. just give it <laughs> a better shot. And I think that I didn't because I was worried that even if I gave it my all, I still wouldn't know how to do it. And then I would have to face this, you know, existential confrontation that like I'm too dumb to actually do physics. And so it was easier um, mentally, I guess, even though I didn't really realize I was doing this to just like ask for help immediately. Yeah. So well, I would recommend not doing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's like, you know, I always, I always try to tell people there's like a budget of like how much effort you should put into something before you're done and ask for help. And yeah. it's like, I feel like when you are, um, there's so often times undergraduates will go way over budget with how much time they put into something before they ask for help. Yes. And especially like my own students do this terribly. And yeah. I'm like, I could have easily like filled in the thought gap without telling you an answer, the next step, literally anything. Just, I would have said like one question and it would have triggered the rest of the problem to be solved. And it's like, you put way too much like time just beating your head against the wall. There's always like a budget of how much time and like hitting that sweet yeah. spot is so important. To like, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, you can't spend two hours per question um, of just being stuck. You'll never finish your homework, especially in graduate school, because you have so many problems. But you also can't spend two minutes and be like, well, I'm stuck. Better Google it. You know, this <laughs> right. spot is somewhere between two minutes and two hours. And I can't right. tell you exactly where it is, but it's somewhere in that region. Um, <laughs> I'm sure so it's like, I'm point, sure it's different for everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah, of yeah. course. Like, if you're like, you know, oh, I'm just not sure like what method I should use to solve this integral. That's a small thing that you could ask, you know, a friend about. But if you read a problem, and you're just like, I don't know where to start. You're like, give it a better try. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, very cool. So now I guess I, I guess now I'm very curious to know about the transition to, gra uh, to graduate school. So uh, you went to University of Pittsburgh for graduate school. Mm -hmm. Um, big school? Like how, how would you? Yeah. Pitt is yeah. a huge school, like a okay. really big school. I think it has like 30,000 students or oh, something. Dang. So I went from like 22,000, <laughs> 3,000 students to 30,000 students. So much bigger school, <laughs> yes. um, which is what I wanted. I like wanted to live in a city. I was sort of done with that small town thing. Um, I wanted to go to a place where there were more people, more stuff to do. Um, but my transition, I would say was not great. Uh, into graduate school. Um, I was the youngest person, I think, in my class. Um, most people had at least really? a year. Yeah, I mean, there was pe some people who were like within a year of me, um, but not a ton. Um, and there were a lot of people who had more experience, either they had come in with a master's or they had gone out and they had been a teacher or had some other job for a while and they went back to graduate school. There weren't a ton of people that went straight into graduate school from undergrad. Um, and those that had, had come from much larger universities than I had. Um, so they had just like, I don't know, taken more classes than me, I think, or I was just unprepared for 
a variety of other reasons. Like I said, you know, I wasn't really giving it my all. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I first came into graduate school and like those classes are hard at the beginning, I was like (laughs) so over my head. (laughs) The Um, first, first year, first year of graduate school is just dreadful. It's absolutely dreadful. Horrible. And your ego just takes a beating every (laughs) single day. Yes. And then put into a blender and shred it and then you get fed it and you have to, you know, just every single day, um, you feel like crap. So <laughs> to put I would it, say to my transition, <laughs> yeah, I would say my transition was not great. Um, you know, at Pitt, what happens is you have to take um, quals your, at the end of the semester. So you can take three quals at the end of your first semester and three quals at the end of your second semester. And I failed um, two of them. And I had never failed an exam before <laughs> in my oh, life. Wow. And so what they ask you to do is retake the course that you failed. So I failed um, E&M in math, unsurprisingly, because I didn't take a lot of math. Um, <laughs> really, just seen that coming. <laughs> um, I didn't fail the class. Sure. I did well sure. in the class, but I failed the the, um, the Qual- qualifying, qualifying exam. is a whole different beast from the class. Right. Yeah. And... So I had to redo those and that felt terrible. And I wasn't the only one, like there were a bunch of people from my year, at least a handful who had to retake it. But I was just like, man, I'm stupid. I'm not gonna make it. I'm gonna fail out. Like I started looking at like alternative careers. Um, I think I even like picked up some brochures from like the engineering (laughs) school. Not that like engineering is like, you know, the necessary backup plan but i was just like searching because i didn't think i was gonna make it um but at that point i was like okay well maybe it's time to actually finally learn how to study <laughs> yeah so i feel I like did. if anybody says that they don't that they never looked for a job during graduate school then they're just a liar yeah. like i can't tell you how many times i just looked up jobs and it's just like i'm just curious i mean like yeah. this would just be all over <laughs> like and i don't know if that's a bad thing right now i think that might be a good thing there's a lot of i mean there's a lot of times and and like there is i i have known countless people who have mastered out and are so much happier and are working yeah. in a great jobs and stuff and i almost it it even almost like reinforces the like the curiosity so it's uh there's absolutely nothing wrong with mastering out and i feel like that's like a a common misconception But like some of the best scientists and science communicators that I know, even here on Twitch, um, have mastered out and are brilliant communicators, brilliant scientists. So uh, it's just an interesting um, it's it's like that that feeling of just like the existential dread that is is the worst thing. (laughs) And I feel like every graduate student has it. Um, But yeah, so so I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Oh, you're fine. I'm not even sure I remember what I was saying. Just that my transition was not good, and I failed two two quals at the beginning. Um, then I had to learn how to study. Um, luckily, I made some some really really good friends in graduate school. You know, I think uh, the Stockholm syndrome really bonded us um, because we became very tight through our suffering. Um, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I know, but it's like a, it's a funny thing. I mean, it's it's not funny, but at the same time, it's just it's like still pretty funny. I, it's relatable. You know, yeah. it's like it's one of those things where you're like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, I think it was so isolating. Like at the beginning, I didn't want to have any friends who were in graduate school because they were like, haha, I'm having fun and I'm enjoying my life, and I was like, screw you, <laughs> everything sucks and I feel terrible. <laughs> and I only wanted to talk to people who were like undergoing like the same existential trauma that I was. So I made some really good friends. We studied together. And when I took the call second time, I did not fail. Um, oh, awesome. Did not pass all of them with flying colors. But, you know, uh, as my department chair used to say, um, 60 was our threshold for passing. 60 equals 100. So uh, <laughs> optimization, <laughs> which is Fantastic. really the only skill you need in life. Well, it's like subject when you can you- when you're like in graduate school it's like you get a b and you're done so it's like how hard do you really want to spend and like i felt and i've said this a lot of people i felt like graduate homework was the worst because you had to work so hard on it and it just didn't matter for a grade like the knowledge was so important that you understood it and it took so long to understand that knowledge but the grade just didn't matter that much yeah and it was like so disappointing you don't get that like um you know serotonin boost that initial gratification yeah 
um, when they pass back a, the homework and you're like, aha, I got a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> continue to suffer <laughs> um so uh what was the what was i don't know if you guys hear that but it's thundering here if i lose power i'm sorry everyone I, it's out of my hands <laughs> um the uh what was it like to change research topics because you were going from um you know something dealing with optics or at least experimentally optics into something that uh like were you did you jump right into quantum computing when you got to graduate school yeah i did so once i was in graduate school um i never really switched topics i met my advisor my second half of my first year um and he was a brand new professor so he was like setting up a lab and everything and he was like i need graduate students if anyone wants to get hired in my lab come talk to me and i went to go talk to him one afternoon after he gave a presentation and i was like i would like to work in your lab you do quantum information i think that sounds so <laughs> you should let me work in your lab and he was like okay sounds good so you know what are your skills like what's your technical background and i remember he was like have you ever built a computer before and i was like no, not really into gaming. So no, I've never built a computer. And he's like, oh, well, you know, can you fix your bicycle? And I was like, I don't have a bicycle. <laughs> Trombone. And he, yeah. And he was just like, well, uh, you're the first one who's come to talk to me so far. So I guess you're hired. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, like you, you did all sorts of optics stuff though. So he probably must have been like excited about that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he was fine with, okay, cool. with that. I think it was just funny because apparently, like, these were questions that his advisor asked him, and he was like, this is how you know if someone has, like, good, you know, machining hands, if someone's, like, good with their hands. He was like, you ask if they can build a computer and if they can fix their bicycle. And I was like, man, those are old-fashioned questions. <laughs> right? You don't need to do I that mean, stuff anymore. So you can specific. buy a computer at the Mac store. <laughs> it just seems so specific to me. I mean, like, that's such a – I mean, I get it, I guess, but, like, you know, I don't know. I guess, I guess, I just, I don't know. It'd be like asking if you can change oil or something like that. Yeah, I just, pretty much. I, I was like, I can Google it and find it on YouTube. <laughs> There's YouTube but... videos. <laughs> yeah. Give me a half like an hour. <laughs> I like to tease him about that still when I'm like, hey, remember when you interviewed me and you asked me a bunch of questions that I didn't know and then you hired me anyways? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, so that, so like, it, I mean, the, how was that transition for you as far as like, exper were you just like right back in the lab and felt at home again? I mean, it was a totally different subject. So it was pretty hard. Like the yeah. skills that I think were the hardest to master were fabrication. So like building all of the chips um, and the qubits and like, you know, it's really like a silicon wafer that you would use for like a typical processor for your computer, but it's super conducting. We built all of those in the lab by hand. Like I built a bunch of them my first year. So I had to learn how to do all of those like micro nano fabrication techniques um which are super hard and super frustrating and sometimes it just doesn't work for no reason and you just go home and cry <laughs> um and you're like why doesn't it work god and they're like nah. um <laughs> and then i guess learning how to use the dilution refrigerator which mm -hmm. is the big cooling apparatus which goes to you know like almost absolute zero and is very delicate and pretty complicated um so learning how to like operate that and not break anything i thought was terrifying i was scared for like three years that i was gonna press the wrong button like i should have had the confidence to like been able to like run the fridge by myself you know after like a year or two or whatever but i like always wanted someone around because i was so terrified that i was gonna break something and make my advisor you know owe the university like five hundred thousand dollars because that's what they cost yeah um Nutty. So it was, again, not like an easy transition. I mean, there was stuff that I was still good at, like soldering. I'm like the best at soldering. Oh, I'm not gonna lie. I love soldering. Um, I, I used, I build things on stream sometimes and mm -hmm. all of my soldering experience I've, I've gained live in front of cameras and oh, it's funny. terrible. It's so bad. I like, I did the, I like the first couple times I was like melting the solder and like hoping it would drip in the right spot. <laughs> and I was like, please just land, please land in the right spot, please. <laughs> yeah. No, I love soldering. I find it like so therapeutic. Um, really? I, I, yeah, I really like it. And I like the smell. I know that's bad because it's like probably carcinogenic, <laughs> but like, I don't know. I find it very soothing. Well, there's a lot of smells that you're not supposed to enjoy that are really good. I know. Like gasoline. Like gasoline. And, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's true. Um, but yeah, the I so I mean, did you so did you learn soldering in graduate school or did you is that 
Did you, was I that a done hobby? It before. No, I think I had done it at some point in undergrad for something, for some lab we had to solder. So that was a skill that came back pretty quickly. And um, like, I always like working with my hands. I'm really good with an Allen wrench. If you ever need like Ikea furniture, like oh, disassembled, man. like I can do that in like I, three seconds. You do like the half a turn and you start, you pull it out and you put it back into a half oh, a turn. Oh, I'm so and good at it. And I'm I, like, <laughs> I have I, a PhD in Allen wrenching. <laughs> <laughs> That's a what? Now, I, like I have, you, everything comes with stinking Allen wrenches now. Like everything. Yeah, I, I have like, I have like, five i just moved recently and i have just like allen wrenches lying everywhere in my apartment <laughs> we had i we just redid our bathroom completely renovated the bathroom mm -hmm. i the one of the biggest surprises i had was how many things that i had to install in the bathroom that needed allen wrenches like all mm -hmm. of the fixtures every single fixture needed an allen wrench and they were all different allen wrench sizes they all came with different allen wrench sizes yep. it was that's is terrifying and even i even have like a different tool like a special like a different tool and i still <laughs> could only do like a half a turn pull it out fine jiggle it so i get the hole do another half turn anyways i i applaud you for your allen wrench ability and for your soldering ability it's like the it's all of the things i wish i could do <laughs> well thank you as the theorist i i would be terrified okay anyways um so i guess uh how was the so then like so you got into graduate school you got into the lab um how was like the bulk of the graduate school experience for you did you feel like writing came naturally i remember now i'm familiar with you because of um the uh, podcast you did with dylan Berger, and i uh and uh, that's when i started following you on on twitter olivia is hilarious on twitter please go follow her on twitter um <laughs> absolutely a riot um and uh I remember you saying that you you didn't write much in your P, in your program, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess I didn't really do a ton of writing. Writing was one of those things that I guess sort of did come natural to me, um, as opposed to like, I don't know, <laughs> fabrication or other weird sorts of skills that you build up as an experimentalist. Writing was never a big issue for me. I always felt fine with it. I mean, you, maybe I disagreed with styles a little bit with co-writers. I remember, you know, they wanted to use more jargon. I'm like very anti-jargon. Um, same, same. Yeah. But yeah, writing was never a huge issue. Although I, like, like you said, I never did a ton of it. So a lot of the skills that are sort of built up as a writer, I think I sort of did on my own. Um, even like, I meant, I meant more like your thesis writing. Like oh, the Man, my thesis is, I don't know. <laughs> I read the abstract. <laughs> Thank you. I wrote my I wrote my thesis during the pandemic, like in two months or something, sitting on my couch in my apartment in Pittsburgh, totally alone and like depressed and sad. Wow. Um, two months? So, yeah. That's insane. How long yeah. is it? I think it's like 180, 180, 190 pages, something like that. Wow. But it's a lot of pictures. I don't know. It was never, it wasn't hard. Like I was worried about the length. I, I remember talking with my advisor and I was like, I don't have enough stuff to say. Like, it's not going to be a hundred pages long, but like, once you get going, it just like, you know, word vomited out. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know how often people read theses. You know what I mean? Like, I know that there's like some people's theses. Theses, 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 um, who get like become famous, you know, but for the majority of people, nobody's going to read it unless you no. did like something groundbreaking. Like there are a few theses that right. like I read, um, because they have more details in them, like than your typical experimental paper. But for the most part, nobody reads your thesis. So I remember my advisor was like, spend a lot of time on like the introduction and the abstract and like, make sure those are really good and then just do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and then just write stuff. That's, that's yeah. cool though. Um, so Stealthy has a question that I'll, I'll, I'll ask you right now. Does the thesis need to be a hundred pages? Cause I don't know. Oh, um, no, but if you write less than a hundred pages, people will judge you. It's like sort oh. of just like <laughs> an implicit the, thing. I got you. It's the it's the unwritten rule. It's the unwritten benchmark. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cause that I mean that is a little bit nerve wracking to have to write down a hundred pages of, of. But there things. are a lot of pictures. There are so many pictures. For <laughs> maybe an experimental. <laughs> but I have no pictures. I have LaTeX. Like I have equations. <laughs> 
You know what I mean? Like, that's all I, I don't know. My uh, maybe... advisor has like an MRI of his dog in his thesis. <laughs> oh, it's one of those things. I got yeah. here. Okay, I, I, I'm picking it Pictures. up now. <laughs> Pictures. Um, okay, so last thing about graduate school before we talk about the transition. Um, so uh, anything in graduate school that surprised you? Like for me, like my biggest surprise of my graduate education was that I actually really love teaching and, and communicating to the public, which I now do. Um, and I didn't anticipate that. Like that was not my whole thing was like, I'm going to be in a room by myself. I'm going to solve quantum gravity. I'm going to be a superstar. You know, like that was me. And then now it's much more like I, you know, have a very realistic project. I love teaching. I love having students. I love having, uh, uh, you know, a community to talk physics with. Um, and that to me is like a complete surprise. Um, is there anything that hit you like that hard? That was like just an absolute surprise about graduate school. Um, I think what surprised me most about graduate school is just like how hard it was and how like life consuming it was. And I think, you know, people try to tell you and people try to warn you, maybe um not a lot of people told me because i don't know i wasn't on the internet as much as i am now i guess i wasn't like part of like <laughs> academic twitter which talks about how terrible graduate school is every single day but i think the most surprising thing is just like realizing that it has to be the main focus of your life i think um which sucks at yeah. some at some level right because you want to be able to do other things and for the first couple years i was one of those people who was like, I'm gonna have, you know, really good work-life balance. I'm gonna go home at six o'clock. Um, I'm not going to, you know, feel guilty for not working on the weekends. And realistically, that didn't get me very far, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I wasn't writing papers or doing experiments as fast as the other people in my program and as fast as I needed to be. So I think the most surprising thing for me is that the advice that people like to give about maintaining a good work-life balance is not really how it is. It's a little bit, you know, I would say rosy colored. Some days, yeah. some weeks, some months, and even like my whole last year, I would say there was no work-life balance. It was right. just work. <laughs> yeah. And that sucked, but I don't regret it. You know, I put in that work up front to get a job that I like and that I'm, uh, you know, really passionate about. But I, I made other sacrifices um, along the way. Yeah. And I mean, like, there's, like, nobody, and I, I'm sure, you know, you would probably say the same. Nobody is saying that this is, like, a, a great system we have in, in, yeah, in place. No. Like, the mat, like, having, uh, like, I think, uh, I don't remember who said it on Twitter, but someone was talking about how a master's program for physics would be so much more beneficial if we actually took it seriously, because like you could get a specialized job in something like quantum computing and having a master's and it'd be so great. And like, that wouldn't require the craziness that it is just to have a competitive resume that is happening right now so it's not like it's a good system it's just but uh, unfortunately i agree it's deeply flawed it's the way I it is i don't know yeah. what to do about it well right now it's too widespread we'd have to have yeah. like yeah it'd have to be like some major change but I, and I've, I've told other people in the past i really do think that like our generation of people will change it i do um i i have high expectations for our generation of 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 scientists, but I don't, um, you know, it's, it's a hard system to change. It's not something that you can just talk a lot about and it will magically change. Um, yeah. but okay. So let's talk about the fun part. You graduated with your PhD yes, I and, did. Yeah. <laughs> and you started working at IBM. Um, yeah. uh, what was that? What was the transition like finding a job finally? Were you like, were you looking for a job like six months before you finished or were you like, you know, you, you finished your, your, your thesis. And then you were like, right now I, I'm going to go find a job or like, uh, where was the time? No, where it you... was, it was pretty far in advance. I think I started <laughs> doing interviews maybe in November and I officially graduated in June. So yeah, like six months in advance, which is oh, maybe a little early, but not too unusual. Um, so I did a couple interviews, um, you know, got a couple offers, but I got this really, really cool offer from IBM. And they basically, um, I, I got 
I was reached out to by the research team, but I was also reached out to by the community and the education team. IBM has its own sort of um, educator and community department, which I think is really cool for that's their, a, that's their awesome. software. Yeah, yeah, for their software, KISSKIT. So I was approached by the research group and the education group, and they were both like, we'd be interested in having you come in for an interview. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. I'm interested in both of these things. Is there <laughs> any way that like I could do both? Like I didn't want to offend like either, you know, PI who was like reaching out to me. And I didn't know how to be like, uh, I don't want you to like compete for me sort of like during the interview. So I was able to like negotiate and work out a contract with IBM where I work 50% on the research side of things. And then I work 50% as an educator as well. The um, dream, though. That's dream. a dream. Oh, yeah, man. I know. It's really like That's what I've always amazing. sort of wanted. And it was just like kind of an accident. That's um, so cool, though. That is absolutely yeah. so cool. Uh, so the transition was pretty easy because nice. IBM does exactly what I did my PhD on. <laughs> so <laughs> right. like a continuation of that. I mean, it was a little different because it was during a pandemic, so they didn't let me into the lab that much. But like the, the topics, the physics was the same. Right. Um. So that transition was really pretty smooth. It was like the same thing, but just for like way more money. Um, and then the education and the communication side of things is something that I've always been really passionate about. And I've sort of, you know, tried to develop those skills on my own in my free time on my Twitter sort of, <laughs> and a little bit, you know, on blogs or writing or whatever. Cool. Um, what is, uh, what do you, I guess maybe, um, I, I would I would like to know like what a day is like doing this and then uh, I guess it's kind of weird because like you know you do fifty percent one place fifty percent other place yeah but like what is a day like in each in each of the separate places? So, um, <laughs> excuse me. They literally are separate places, mm -hmm. so that's sort of funny. Um, so IBM <laughs> has an office in New York City, uh -huh. which is um, just for IBM Quantum, which is a separate you know sort of like division than like not a whole division, but like, you know, it's different than just IBM as a whole. Um, so they have an office in New York City and there are no labs there. It's pretty much like a collaboration space. Mm -hmm. So when I do community and education stuff, I go there. Um, it just opened cause you know, pandemic. So I haven't been there that many times. <laughs> and what I do there is I talk to um, the video squad. We have like a really, really awesome full-time video team at uh, IBM Quantum and they do the KISSKIT YouTube channel. So I've done a lot of work with them on seminars and interviews and different sorts of programs that they're collaborating and uh, brainstorming. I do, excuse me, educational content. Like we have a textbook, IBM Quantum has developed its own textbook. Um, nice. So I do writing for them. I do a lot of, you know, checking the code, checking the physics. Uh, I'm sort of trying to develop like a branch of the textbook that's just for people with an experimental background like me um and i do all sorts of other miscellaneous random things as well i like hosted a conference for the first time in my life i like sort awesome. of acted as like an event coordinator which is like way harder than i initially thought it would be so like hats off to those people who do that full time that job is hard um i was drained um and then <laughs> when i do experimental work um i can do some from home like some simulations and stuff can be done from my laptop and i like vpn to like a server so i can use more powerful machines and stuff like that but i can do that from home and then when i go into the lab um i do work on the dilution refrigerators so for instance i'm like sort of building up one of the dilution refrigerators that we're going to use for some experiments in the future right now so I'm putting in like a lot of cables, a lot of isolators, a lot of like physical cryogenic components and like bolting them to the fridge and, you know, sort of acting as like a quantum engineer. Sure. Um, and we'll take data on that fridge pretty soon, but we're in the very, very beginning stages of, of that lab right now. So when someone buys, I don't know if it's, if it's free or if they have to buy it now, but when someone acquires <laughs> time on your quantum computer, or is oh, that- free. It, Oh, it is free? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't remember um, if it was a, a marketable thing yet, um, but that's cool. And uh, like, what is it, what is it, how does it work? Like, say I wrote a code mm -hmm. that I knew matched your system, mm -hmm. um, so I got time, and I sent it in. Like, how does that process work? 
Yeah, so you have to just re register through IBM and you get like a little um, username. And once you register with your username, you get access to like 15 machines, I think, for free right off the bat. And you can apply for like, you know, bigger, better ones or whatever if you had the need. Or if you're a researcher, you can apply for the researcher's program and get access the same way. Um, but otherwise, you just go in and with your username, you type it in and you tell it what machine you want it to run on and you say, you know, run job or whatever, or job.run, you know, parentheses, whatever the Python code is. <laughs> um, and then it goes off to the cloud, the server, it gets processed and it gets put in the queue. And so you get a wait time. So if you, you know, code your thing correctly, it'll say like your position is number five in queue, wait time is blah, blah, blah. And then when it gets processed, it'll either print out the results, you know, in whatever format you choose to have it presented to yourself in the Python code and the notebook. I usually use Jupyter notebooks to, to run scripts and stuff. And then you can also go online to the IBM quantum experience as well. And you can see that your job has processed and it stores every job that you've ever run with that username for you. So you can go back and look cool. it up and, you know, reprocess data if you wanted to. And I, uh, are people still like this was a, a thing i don't know if it's still a thing um but what i wrote in my uh quantum like my graduate quantum 2 class was like a classical code that was probabilistic um is there are people still doing that or are they writing purely quantum codes in python right now and getting processing time um i think it's the second one the, okay, the latter cool. one that you were talking about like mostly people are writing either like educational scripts to sort of understand you know what the hardware is doing and how does it work or they're um applying for lengthy periods of time to test real algorithms and new innovations to improve the the gate fidelity or the processor time or you know something like that but they're really or they should be specialized for the quantum you know processor itself um so i'm trying to think of how to ask this question um so you ever have people who are like i guess how sensitive do you have to be for people trying to figure out the inner workings of your machine like uh when people submit code that might be like that might tell them something that they're not supposed to know um is that something that I you guys mean, are worried about a lot or is it something that some because like when i guess like the i guess the grounding for the question that i have is that like we had some ideas for work in a uh with work with a quantum computer um and it was one of those things where like okay if you set if you write up a paper with data about that you extract that you got from the computer then you're under all sorts of like um you have to send it to IBM or um, other places to go through like NDLs and stuff or whatever they're called, like the non-disclosure yeah. agreements, NDAs. Right. There we go. Um, is that something that you guys are concerned with a lot or like in your lab, in your lab specifically, are you just like code it up and send it in and, you know, see what happens? Yeah. I mean, I've never had to worry about that sort of thing for me specifically. It probably arises every once in a while, but in general, the information that you can extract from the computers um just through the code base like you can know and it's not proprietary a lot of the proprietary stuff is like the engineering mm. um and like the fabrication that goes into the chip which you oh, would never be able to understand from just running codes <laughs> anyway the dumb theorist <laughs> no it's just a different thing you know, know it's like I'm, well I'm did joking. they like wire their chip this way or that way i don't know i would like to know but it's proprietary but you can't figure that out just from being like Run code. <laughs> Run sure. Code. Sure. Um, now, I, I don't know if you're at liberty to say this, but which which department do you like more? Oh, the research or the communication yeah. side? Are you allowed to say? I can't say. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess I can say, but like, I don't have a preference. I mean, I, I would say I would like them to become more unified in the future. That would be my sure. hope. That's a, um, that's a great, that's a great response i was mostly joking but that's a great response because um yeah it's it's true i mean like the high level research is very difficult for the public to grasp and like now that i'm in quantum computing i get high level questions uh, i don't even know like even remotely close how to 
say in words the answer to the question and it's it would be so i mean like that's going to be an exciting thing is when like we can when we know quantum computing enough where we can explain it to the public and everybody's on the same page and everybody's still excited about it you know that's going to be a very exciting thing um yeah no for sure and i think like the researchers like i think right now a lot of the public facing you know persona comes from the community and the education side because they're the ones sort of going out here and doing talking and speaking engagements and stuff like that but i would really like to see the researchers get into more of that as well i mean not many of them have expressed a ton of interest so far but like i would really like to see them step forward and do that kind of thing because i think those skills are so valuable and like i would also love to see the researchers like get credit for the really really tough work that they're putting in every single day in the lab like i know personally like if i developed you know some awesome algorithm i would want to talk about it i wouldn't want like somebody <laughs> right. representing me to go out there and talk about it i would be like that's my thing nobody can explain it better than me um which is maybe not the truth for everybody, but <laughs> I think you can develop those skills, you know, just by sure. practicing. Oh, I agree. I agree. Or or being taught, you know, like the um Yeah. I think it's imp- a teachable skill. Yeah, I think improv is like such a huge Yes, I did benefit. improv when I was a little kid. I didn't mention that earlier, but like when I was really little, I did a ton of improv. Which See, is how I developed my amazing sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I I was in drama class. But I was never like, I never did improv. You sing, huh? Oh, I was I was in a metal band. What's your favorite? What when you were when you you strike me as someone who liked rock? Yeah, like yeah. (laughs) What was your? I don't know why people keep always say that, but like yeah. Because I mean, it's just like you got the picture with like a jean jacket. I hope it's a jean jacket. Is it a jean jacket in the picture? Oh, in my Twitter picture, it's a leather jacket. Yeah, no, I am into so much more hardcore rock. I mean, like okay, so what's your favorite band from high school? From high school? From high school. In high school, I was super into the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, okay. We could have gone a couple different ways rock, with that. But, like, I was super into <laughs> no, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Good song. By the way. By the way, it's a fin- phenomenal song. Um, can't stop. A lot of good songs. But, like, yeah. oh, yeah. I know every lyric to that song. But, like. <laughs> That's a, that must have took some time. Um, but, like, it's... before that, I was, like, really into, like, Led Zeppelin, ACDC. Um, oh, wow. Old school. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um. What about, how's your music taste now? Have you developed into more of a, like I, on the stream, I like a lot of instrumental metal music. So okay. like we have a lot of like good, like very melodic, very um, organized and well-written songs. Um, like what have, what type of, how has your music taste evolved from high school? I think it's school? like very eclectic at this point. Like I used to be one of those people that was like, I hate country, I hate rap. And then now I've sort of, come to understand i not to be like one of those like cliche annoying people that's like i like everything but like i can find something that i like in basically every genre like i've been to metal shows nice. um i have gone to country shows like i can not so find nice. people who are <laughs> there are some there are some i'm just joking I'm kidding. I'm kidding. it's good, good. <laughs> it's good um, um so i i guess so what's your favorite band now then we'll, we'll compare the two from high school to now i don't know if i can say i have a favorite band now one band that I'm like I've been into since like early graduate school is the Pretty Reckless, um, who you may or may not know. They're pretty hard rock, um, but the front, the lead singer is a woman. I think her voice is awesome. Pretty Reckless. Um, I'm gonna listen. Mm-hmm. Some of the metal, some um, metal bands uh, who have uh, women, uh, woman vocals are unbelievable. Like yeah, unbelievable I love them. talented. I like the the metal grungy female vocalists in terms of metal i think that those are like the coolest that's cool yeah there's uh one of my favorite bands that has a female vocalist is uh unleash the archers her her vocals are just her range and the amount of like variability she has in her voice unbelievable um but yeah no i was never into improv but improv would be cool we were talking about improv (laughs) (laughs) um yeah, but improv improv is like so like Stony Brook University does a lot of science communication. They have that like uh Yeah, Al- they have the Alan Alda. Alan Alda. Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that's where I got my COVID vaccine. <laughs> Did you wait in the Alan Alda Center for Yeah. Wait, really? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it was like right across the street. I don't remember. I remember seeing a sign that said like Did he Alda did Alda. did Mr. Alda do it himself? No. Oh, no, okay. He's not a medical professional, unfortunately. No, well he I mean he played one on TV. It's not the same. Cliche. <laughs> 
cliche and boring. Okay, anyways. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's see here. Where do you find, where do you see your, your, okay, so we're going to do two things. Where do you see your research in 5, 10, or 50 years? You can pick all of them or one of them or two of them. Your research, quantum computing, I guess, in general. We'll say quantum oh, yeah, computing. I was like, in, in my research, I want to be retired. Fridges. <laughs> like, I don't want to <laughs> still be, I don't know, maybe I would, but like, I don't think I'm going to be one of those people that's like going to want to work every day when they're 80. Um, personally, I don't think. I think I'm going to pursue other activities at that point. Anyway, um, what do I see? How do I see quantum computing research going in five years? So, I mean, I think in five years, it's going to be not so dissimilar to the way it is right now, where we're trying a lot of new creative solutions to try and improve gate fidelities and the performance of the qubits and the processors and the hardware themselves. In 10 years, I think we will have reached the threshold and the point that we call a uh, quantum advantage which is basically, you know, that that uh, singularity where quantum computers can do things that classical computers can't do and things that are actually useful. Um, so I think that that is going to be achieved in, you know, within 10 years. In 20 years, I mean, it's, I think that anything that I would predict would be wrong. I hope in 20 years, <laughs> no, I want, I want to be wrong. I hope in 20 years, quantum computers are doing things that nobody's even talking about yet. Ah. Um, I think that that's going to be the coolest. If I had to put money on it, I would say the coolest thing that quantum computers are going to be used for is something that nobody has even started talking about yet. I really do believe that. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So now that was the first part. Second part is where do you see yourself in five, 10, 20 years? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm going to be doing next year. I mean, <laughs> I really like my job. If, if people wanted to keep paying me to do this sort of similar thing for a really long time, I think I would be happy. Although I realized that, you know, I work for a company, I work for a business and doing this sort of 50, 50 thing is good for somebody who's, um, you know, not a director or like a manager, but more of like a, a a technical lead type person, then it's okay to sort of have those split responsibilities. But in the future, I think they would like to see me if I stuck with IBM, pick either the communication <laughs> or yeah. the or the research side of things. I don't think they would prefer me to do this 50-50 thing. But on the other hand, like nobody's like told me that like I absolutely can't. Um, <laughs> I awesome. think I would like to sort of carve out my own role too. I hope, you know, in five, 10 years, I'm doing something that nobody has done before in terms of like their actual position in the company. I hope I'm not, you know, director of whatever. I hope I'm defining my own path and doing my own thing that maybe nobody has exactly done before. That's awesome. That's very, very cool. Um, like, uh, yeah, I, I think that's amazing. Um, and I agree with you on where quantum computing is going to be. I mean, uh, I know I, I just, I have no idea where 20 years is going to be or yeah. let alone 50 years, but I mean, that would be amazing to have. Oh somewhere. yeah. I didn't even try 50 years. <laughs> it's too far. It's too far. Um, uh, so, uh, at, at this point, let me just, uh, for those of you who have joined us later, um, let me, um, again, introduce Olivia. I will put the, uh, the full blurb in chat. Olivia is my guest tonight. Um, uh, quantum computational specialist working at IBM as both an educator um, for the public and also as a researcher um, working on quantum computing. Uh, there is, um, we are going to take a quick break now. Uh, I think we're kind of like getting ready to do the Q&A. Now would be the time to ask your questions. I don't know if I have a moderator who can keep an eye on uh, the queue um, during the break, but if not, then I will only be able to accept one question from each person at a time. Well, our queue is getting kind of full, so we're going to kind of stop the questions pretty soon anyways. And these are long questions. I oh, kind of no. like, normally it's just like, what do you like about ice cream? But now it's just like, <laughs> it's like super intense quantum computing questions. So, <laughs> um, so not ice cream. All right. <laughs> not ice cream. Uh, but you can, always, I mean, like we, I, 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 I say I don't know to questions all the time. I highly encourage it. Even if you do know and you want to say I don't know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna judge, and they don't know the difference. So just you know, it's whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll do my very best either way. 
but we are going to take a quick break just five minutes we're gonna uh i mean i'm gonna grab an adult beverage um and you guys are all welcome to do the same um we're gonna come back this is gonna be a more of a fun thing uh more casual after the q a um it's gonna get serious we're gonna olivia and i are gonna play against you in a game of quantum chess so it could get very aggressive um, but you know, so I hope we win. well, I'm glad I'm on your team then because <laughs> we can both be aggressive towards towards chat. I think that's okay. I I'm think they'll, down, chat. they'll take it out on me tomorrow, and that will be okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, we're gonna take a quick five, uh, and uh, we'll see you in just a second. Uh, sit tight. Hello, everybody, we are back, adult beverage in hand questions on screen here we go we're gonna start going down the row of questions we have quite a few for olivia so if we um there is <coughs> there is the always the aching problem of time so um we might have to cut the questions short um but uh i do appreciate everybody's questions and let's get to it so the first question comes from puzzle gamer um, who asked this pretty much in the beginning of, of, of the stream. So maybe hopefully we've answered this question. But um, Puzzle Gamer says, I don't know anything about quantum computers. So this might be a dumb question. Nope. Um, but since digital computers are based on zeros and ones, uh, definite values producing 100% accurate answers, does that mean uh, that since quantum effects are based on probabilities, the um, I lost the rest of the question. Maybe it's um, probabilistic answers. Oh, and I'm at the top of chat. So um i missed the rest of the question so maybe puzzle gamer if you could um user i can actually look up them up if you give me just a second yeah sure i did not anticipate that okay oh there we go i got it right away awesome um so does that mean that since quantum effects are based on probabilities the quantum computers answers cannot be trusted a hundred percent accurately uh no that's not what that means because when you do a measurement on a quantum computer, even though everything is probabilistic, when you perform a measurement, you still force what we say uh, is a collapse of, of the wave function, which is the thing that contains all of these probabilities, mathematically speaking. So you still end up, you know, theoretically with definite zeros and definite ones, and you can't measure anything besides that. The, the sort of uncertainty that people talk about um, from quantum computers comes from the noise and the other issues that arise from the imperfect hardware in and of itself. I think yeah. that answers that. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that the, the um, I mean, like, once you take the measurement, it, it's basically a classical bit at that point. But, like, and, and when you do these measurements, you do, like, you don't do one. You right. want, like, you a probabilistic do... distribution so you can figure right, out. Right, yeah. right, right. So you might do, like, 600 measurements or something, just, you know, and you find an average. Right. And you have errors associ associated with the machinery, the hardware. Because, um, you know, we don't have a perfect quantum computer yet. Sure. Um, but the, the errors don't come from it being quantum. It comes from it being uh, noisy. Yeah. And like that's so that so you still get you still get definite answers, but it's more of like a definite answers that are like on a probabilistic distribution. Mm -hmm. And yeah, cool. Um, so do you need a lot of complicated hardware to get answers out of a quantum computer? Because the output would be a real number instead of a single bit. Um, yeah, single I mean, OK, you need like very expensive room temperature electronics, which can handle different types of signal processing. So um, you might need an arbitrary waveform generator. You might need microwave generators. Um, there's a lot of work going on right now with FPGAs. So all of these different sorts of expensive <coughs> room temperature electronics are sort of how you differentiate um, signals, which have real and imaginary components. I see. Cool. Uh, next up is from, oh, that was from Haney. Uh, we'll have more from Haney, uh, I think, coming up. So um, Haney's for for Haney's work. <laughs> um, Geo Shothar asks, uh, I am just getting into the physics major, uh, and my departmental advisor told me to take a computer science class. So that's what I've been doing over the summer. I'm not really liking it. How important have coding skills been uh, for graduate school? I have another one where that cut off. Um, Geo, let me look this up really quickly. 
Oops, I missed. Ha! Huh. LaTeX. <laughs> Jeez, come on. Uh, here we go. Uh, let's see. So, uh, there it is. Um, how important is having coding skills in grad school? I want to get into theory, and I'm going to be a junior next semester um, to let you know where I'm at. So, um, in quantum computing, how important is having coding abilities? I mean, it's pretty important. Although you're the theorist, um, you can probably speak this more accurately than me, but like I'm an experimentalist, so I code less than a theorist and I still uh, have to know quite a bit. And there are always going to be, you know, people who know way more than you who majored and specialized in computer science. And those are great people to have around and become yeah. very good friends with them um, because they can fix your code and help you. Um, but you still you do kind of have to know a lot. Yeah, from a theory point of view, from my personal theory point of view, I'm like the, because I studied astroparticle physics, I'm like the token particle physicist. So like my whole purpose is understanding what happens with relativistic quantum information. It's not like putting anything meaningful down on a computer. You know, it's like, will the information reach the destination? Like, mm -hmm. what does it look like in order to like get it to reach the destination? You know, so that's kind of where my realm is at right now. But I can't imagine finishing my PhD without having having at least the ability to read code and communicate with someone who can write it probably just faster than me, <laughs> you yeah, know? And no, like, absolutely. Like yeah. when I was saying, you can always talk to people who are more specialized than you. I'm not saying you need to rely on them, but like you need to be able to communicate with those people. I might need to, to rely on them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do too, but you don't, that doesn't have to be like, you know, the goal, but you right. do have to be able to communicate with them. Yeah, and definitely. so you kind of need to know a lot of coding. Um, if you don't like it, like I don't love coding, to be honest. It's sort of more of like a means to an end for me, Yeah. Um, which is why I'm not an astronomer, because like pretty much all astronomers do is code and I didn't want to do that. Um, but you, I mean, you do have to use it. Yeah. Um, Haney's Vorp uh, also asks, what was the most amazing thing you learned about quantum physics? What do you hope to uncover? What do I hope to uncover? Um, I want to build the world's first universal quantum computer. That's what I hope to uncover. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not a one person job. <laughs> so that's going to be me, hopefully uh, contributing a small amount with a team of, you know, many tens or hundreds of other people who are very smart and intelligent as well. But awesome. I think the coolest thing about quantum computing, I mean, there are so many cool things. The measurement problem, yeah. like how we still don't know how measurement works. What is an observer? Who knows? We just what's, define these things. And like we what's going guess. on inside? Like that's yeah, the... Like what is a wave function? Yeah. Is that a real thing? Amazing. Probably not. We don't have another good explanation. I mean, so I think the coolest thing that I've uncovered about quantum mechanics is that we don't really understand it you know fundamentally like there are a million famous quotes from much smarter people than me talking about how they don't understand quantum mechanics yeah. but nevertheless it's still so useful that's so the useful. Weird, that's the mind-boggling thing right like we don't understand it what the hell is going on oh but we can use it to do crazy stuff we can make predictions that's more accurate than any other working theory that we have so, meaningful computations it's yeah. amazing it's amazing um cool great answer uh great question um how do you, uh so next up is from angel how did your experience with the physics jerry go um considering um that you did not take some higher level physics classes what was so can you expound on your uh i mean if you're if you're comfortable with it expanding on the uh your sure. your pgre experience yeah they can't take my phd away now um <laughs> i mean maybe they could but i'd have to do something way worse than share my physics jury score um <laughs> No, I mean, so I thought it was pretty hard. I didn't really know how to prepare for it because I hadn't taken two of the major courses that they test you for on the uh, physics theory, thermo and e &M. So, man, I was guessing on a lot of those questions, which like, I know you're not even supposed to do. You're supposed to like skip ones that you're really not sure about. Because <laughs> they don't penalize you if you just skip right? them. But whatever so i remember my advisor from one of my reus was like oh americans are really bad at the physics theory and like statistically that's true americans don't perform well on it compared to um students coming from other countries for various reasons and women also perform extra bad at it for you know other various reasons um 
anxiety and not having the right type of performance and you know not having the background and experience and all sorts of different things so my advice was like aim for the something in the 40th percentile like aim to get half the questions correct and i was like okay that is my goal i will aim for that and that's exactly what i did nice <laughs> so awesome. yeah again doing exactly what was expected of me and no more because um <laughs> i thought that that was good enough and I was you know trying to optimize and I had pretty good grades and I had research experience and I just thought you know this is not going to be the star of my application but nice. who cares yeah another it's another it's another one of those uh check boxes it's just Box a hurdle checkbox. it's just like you know a hazing thing that you go through and doesn't actually tell anybody how good you are at physics right. it's just the admission boards need something to go off of because they can't let everybody in and so they're like oh well you know here's a test yeah, it's like it's it is a beneficial to someone who doesn't have certain um, like it's beneficial to people who don't have like all of the opportunities that like say you and I had with undergraduate right. research and everything and good you know and ab ability to take classes unimpeded and things like that. Where like um, then someone who does have those things might be able to really shine through on the physics theory. But the problem mm -hmm. is is that it's not used that way. It's more of like a you know, a school's kind of like touting off about you have to have all of that stuff and a really high physics GRE and like all this. Other. Yeah. It's... And like, I know there are some schools who like won't even look at your application if you get less than, you know, a 50th percentile mark. Yeah. So like just, you know, schools stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's so silly and it's expensive. It's a really expensive <laughs> exam. Um, commentator asks, can quantum computers run video computer console games? Um, <laughs> I know the answer. Uh, and if so, could one create uh, many virtual PCs on a quantum computer equivalent to high-end gaming computers? Um, I'm kind of curious about creating many virtual PCs. Um, but other than that, go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, we can't. You can. There are some video games that people have made that you can use a quantum processor for but just as like an educational type yeah. of uh, learning thing, you can't play real video games on a quantum computer yet. And in the future, I don't know why you would want to anyways. Cla <laughs> classical computers do perfectly good. Yeah, they're really good at that. We don't need anything else. <laughs> like I've seen the new PS5, it's and pretty I impressive. I don't know if you want that like that uncertainty or error or anything coming into play when you're like in the yeah, middle of something. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. You don't Your wanna, system like, decoheres. <laughs> right, you don't wanna be playing Halo and like, shoot the dude in front of you and have the <laughs> thing probabilistically fly off and smack you in the face instead. I don't think that would be fair. Um, all right, cool. Uh, Puzzle Gamer asks, do you think uh, or know if quantum computers will eventually make digital computers obsolete? No, I'm of the opinion, no. Yeah. I think there's a minority of people who might disagree with me, but I think quantum computers are going to be used for very specialized purposes, um, you know, they're not faster at running every sort of algorithm and every sort of process that you would use a computer for. They're very good at a small number of things. So I think it's more likely that like a university computing center would have a quantum computer. Right. Um, and that you can use that for like special types of computations that you want to run at a very high level. But I don't think there's going to be any need for like the average person to need a quantum computer. Really I agree. Like maybe like some really intense hobbyists or something. Yeah, unless you're like a really intense hobbyist, but like, you know, most people don't really use supercomputers now either. Right. We're talking about quantum computers being more specialized than a supercomputer. How many people right. have used a supercomputer? Not that many. Right. Agreed. Um, commentator asks, because qubits aren't binary, does that make uh, make it easier for information to get lost? Um, I asked because binary feels solid, but qubits feels like there's a lot of uncertainty. So it's not that the information gets lost because it's quantum. The information gets lost because when you couple to that type of system, when you couple to a qubit, which you have to do in order to extract information, the information leaks. So if it was like in a vacuum, in a preserved perfect cavity, then the information wouldn't get lost. But it's just that we, as the observers of the non-quantum world, of the quantum world being non-quantum, have to peer into the cavity. Yeah. Then the information uh, can escape. <laughs> it's like it's like it's not so much that like the information is lost. It's kind of it's just like it's untouchable until it's measured. 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it's you. They call it in Nielsen and Chang. I I will probably never forget this, but it's just before a measurement, it's a black box of information, and right. like you can spread it out, and you know how it's being spread out theoretically. Like you might not know all of the noise and the errors and everything like that, but you know how it's being spread out theoretically. But that doesn't mean that you have access to it. It's still a right. black box of information. I think that's often confused with like, because classical computers is so like, you know, the bit as it moves. Yeah. Um, like, I think it's very hard. Uh, and one thing that's really important for people like you <laughs> who do like the communication thing to like, to explain to people that like, and I think that's like one of the things that makes people a little bit uneasy about quantum computing still is that like, we don't know what happens to the information inside of it. It's, it is the measurement problem. It really right. is the measurement problem. And, and I would say that it's good, you know, oh, it's you exciting. that it's good yeah. that you don't know what's going on inside yeah. of it while it's doing the computation. That's what lets it be quantum because right. as soon as you take off the lid of the box, so to speak, then it's not quantum anymore. And the error is associated with your measurement. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, Haney asks, what are we technologically waiting for, for the quantum computer to become real for society? Are there physical tech that we need to materialize? Yeah, so the big breakthrough that we're waiting for is error correction. Um, So right now, qubits uh, have this really annoying property called decoherence. So if I have a qubit, which you can sort of think of as like a 3D sphere, Mm -hmm. and I put it in, you know, the, the one state, it tends to decay spontaneously over time to the ground state because everything wants to be, you know, in the most relaxed ground state. That's one of the physics axioms, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, So it tends to, you know, fall down and that information isn't stable in tens of microseconds. Yeah. Um, So we need a way to correct for those errors, which naturally arise when they happen. And the way that we're going to go about correcting those is through something called error correction which basically means if you have, you know, one physical qubit, say in the center of your processor, you need an array, a ring of other physical qubits around that center qubit. And what those qubits can do is detect when an error happened in the middle qubit and sort of poke it and say, hey, you made a mistake, correct yourself. And then it can, you know, bit flip back into the state that it was supposed to be in. But we're waiting until we have processors that are big enough and powerful enough to be able to implement error correction. We can theoretically do it. We have codes that can do it, but we need the hardware to uh, to be better. Yeah. Um, so the next question from Haney was, is it difficult to get information out of quantum computing because of the nature of qubits? But I think that answer is pretty, um, it answers both those questions because that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, And he also asks, how much do you work with engineers uh, to put your ideas into action? Um, I think I kind of feel like you answered that before. You're you're hands on. You're the you're the one that's in the in the fridge. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times I'm the one doing the engineering. Um, You know, we have a few engineers um, who work in the lab at IBM. It's not like there are no engineers, but in a way you have to pick up those skills yourself as an experimental physicist. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, Tropical says, uh, Tropical Geek, uh, a longtime viewer, uh, says, uh, tell her we are proud of her. Um, <laughs> she would also like to know, uh, Tropical would also like to know, uh, what, uh, YouTube channel, uh, you mentioned, Kiske, and, uh, and lastly, uh, what is, I mean, can we just, like, YouTube, like, search Kiske? If you Kiske? YouTube Kiske, yeah, it'll come okay. up. Cool. Um, and then, uh, lastly, Tropical would like to know, uh, can you explain a qubit? Yeah. So the way that I like to explain qubits is relative to a classical bit. A classical bit um, is usually made out of, you know, silicon, and you can sort of picture it as a one-dimensional object. I like to think of a light switch. So you can flip it up. That's the one state. You can flip it down. That's the zero state. You can't put a light switch in between. It can be up or down. That's it. Um, A quantum bit you can visualize as a sphere, like I was saying before. And there's a, a vector. There's an arrow that points from the center of the sphere to the up position. Um, the north pole we say that's the one state or the south pole we say that's the zero state but unlike the light switch it can point to anywhere on the surface of the sphere so that's an infinite number of states that it can be in right so you can already see that this can contain you know a lot more information because it's a larger subspace and when you add bits to classical bits it grows linearly right you have one light switch you have two light switches okay that's linear but when you have a 3D object, you couple it to another 3D object, you couple it to another 3D object, 
that's exponential. Yeah. So the amount of information, the amount of computational space that you have to perform algorithms is much larger. That is the core theoretical uh, essence of a quantum bit, I think. That light switch ref, uh, light switch analogy, best best explanation of a qubit I've ever heard. That's fantastic. Oh, thank you. I have worked on that. <laughs> the uh, like the t the light switch to block sphere. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Um. Just I'm just admiring. Okay. Now, <laughs> um. Very good. Uh. Thank you, NC, for finding the um the uh the Kiskit YouTube. Uh. If you are watching on YouTube or you are watching the VOD, um, it is in the Discord. You can find the oh, Discord awesome. in, thank the dis you. in the description below. Um. So feel free to hop in the Discord and grab that YouTube channel. <laughs> um. Next question. Alan says, "Is programming on a quantum computer standard standardized?" Uh, as it uh, as in could code uh, to to send to IBM also work at Google? Um, no, but that's just because of the capabilities that each company has enabled for their hardware. Um, so Google uses a programming framework called Circ, um, and IBM uses Qiskit, but they're both Python wrappers. So you could expand, you know, the wrapper. And you could theoretically change the code and the functions. Um, and, you know, it's all just based on the same type of Python coding framework. But right now, uh, you can't do that. Is there someone... Okay, I'm, now work with me on this. Is there someone who, like, works on the wrapper? Is there... Oh, yeah. we have, So there like, are quantum wrappers? Yeah, there is like a whole team at IBM who just work on updating, you know, the Qiskit software and adding new capabilities and new features to it like every single week. There's a huge team of people doing that. So, if that was if that was your question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really just wanted to make sure that um that we could confirm that there were in fact quantum wrappers. Um just anybody who's watching, if you want to be a quantum rapper, I guess it's a thing. When I said rapper, um, I meant with the W, I not AM. <laughs> I saw somebody but in the it, chat write it quantum sounds rapper. Great. Like... <laughs> and I love it. And we're going to cut and print and you can do what you can do anything. Okay. Oh, now, no. <laughs> next up, Linux, Linux physics says, uh, how long does a quantum computer run? Say for a um, Shor's factoring algorithm against a 32 qubit number. That's a highly specific question. Well, right now, I mean, that's a small number. That's a small factoring uh, uh, scale that you're not really going to see an improvement in a quantum computer versus a classical computer. It's not like every single problem is faster on the quantum computer than the classical computer. It's that the, what we call big O notation, like the, the, the runtime scales differently. So if you have a runtime that scales exponentially faster, with n, where n is the number of bits in the number that you're trying to, or the number of digits in the number that you're trying to factor, you only are going to see that difference when n gets large, right? Yeah. So 32 isn't big enough to really see that difference. So I'm not sure what that number would be exactly. I got you. Okay. Uh, okay. So commentator asks, can we play Minecraft on a quantum computer? We answered that one already, so we'll skip that one. Uh, Strawberry Jesus says, do you uh, do you do any quantum machine learning? Um, could you explain a bit on how that might work? So this answer is easy. Uh, no, <laughs> I <laughs> don't do any quantum machine learning and I don't feel comfortable explaining it. Um, we are doing a summer school. <laughs> IBM is doing a summer school on quantum machine learning. If you would like to learn more about it, um, I'm probably going to attend some of those sessions. Yeah, myself. I need that. I need that. I think um, it's going to start in a few weeks. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but you can find it online. Okay, I'm going to look. So, um, I'll my, do a quick plug for that. My group has recently, as in like last week, um, mm -hmm. agreed we want to take on a quantum machine learning project as a group because we don't have like a group wide project. We have quantum computing, we have machine learning as kind of like mm -hmm. separate things. But now like a week ago, we agreed that like we want to do a quantum computing machine learning problem. So that's awesome. I need, well, I'll have to find information on that afterwards. Um, Cause yeah, to me, I I'm I like- could help you more, but that's like <laughs> quantum computing is a big field and quantum machine learning is not my area of expertise. Uh, Strawberry asks, is it open? Is it oh, an yeah. open? Okay, Those awesome. are all open source. Um, so Circ for Google, Qiskit for IBM, all open source. So please. Oh, you know, um, the machine download. learning, the school, oh, the summer school. 
the it's free um it might be i know there's a cap on the number of seats that are available so i don't know if it's full or not but it's free. okay cool and will like the youtube will it be on like youtube afterwards type of it deal? should be open afterwards so even okay, if cool. you don't get to see it live i'm sure you can get the content later fantastic love it um the it's like this whole the pandemic one good thing is is people can handle this stuff so much better now so like when yeah. you miss conferences and things like that it's everything so open source now it's awesome mm -hmm. um haney also asks how much science outreach do you think is reasonable for a scientist should they be on twitter uh, or talking to high schools or whatever i mean i think that you should do as much as you are comfortable with i don't think there's any like quota you need to fill yeah. if it's something that you like you should do it because it'll make you happy if it's something you don't like you should probably do it because that might mean you don't have the skills to enjoy it yet and you should develop those skills because i always have felt strongly that if you're not good at communicating your science um what good is your science okay. uh you should be able to explain what you're doing and why people should care about it at every level i think that it's important in order to educate you know the masses about what their tax dollars are funding at a fundamental level but i also think it makes you become a better scientist and better able to communicate with your colleagues as well absolutely i i, I think it gives you a better understanding of, of what you're doing and i think and it that's... makes you smarter yeah yeah it does every time it i really have does. to explain something i'm like oh i never thought about it explaining it that way before i actually understand it better now so yeah and some i guess i think some people think i'm strange that i still watch science communication programs of like things that I studied back in undergraduate and stuff like that. But like at this point, I'm just wondering, like I'm wondering how better presenters can present things better than me. <laughs> like, and like I I'm about taking- I that all the time. I, I yeah. always watch science communicating channels, like even really, really basic ones, especially about quantum computing where I don't learn anything, but I learn about how I like things explained to me and or yeah. how I don't like things explained. So it just makes you better all around. Awesome. I agree 100%. Uh, Perk asks, how does quantum computing change the cost structure of innovation in computer science? I'm, I'm not sure what that question means exactly. I would say we're asking giant questions and it has a giant cost. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. I mean, it's very expensive, if that's yeah. what you're asking. It's not going to get cheaper anytime soon. Um, luckily the government is, you know, supporting, uh, this cutting edge research and they're helping it a little bit. And there are obviously a lot of private businesses who are funding it as well, but it's not cheap. It's much more expensive than classical computing. Right. But I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. What you said earlier that it answers big, it ans answers really big questions. Like the whole, like, I mean, um, Nielsen and Chang, again, it's the Bible, so I'm going to keep saying it because it's the only quantum computing I know. Um, the uh, They talk about, uh, um, like, category category theory mm -hmm. and, like, uh, you know, P versus NP and, like, what problems are NP complete and things like that. And, like, these yeah. are problems that can be, you know, theoretically, we have the understanding that they should be solvable with quantum computers. But, like, we don't know... Like there's a lot of work to get to that point. And that's a huge question that's been eluding physicists and scientists for yeah. dec you know, and, a long like, time. Does P equal NP? I mean, right, yeah. you will figure it out along the way, but like that's a millennium question, the millennium prize, I think. Yeah. You know, these are the biggest questions that, that exist in computer science as well. So I think it's important to fund, you know, fundamental basic research. It's one of my, I would say, core beliefs yeah, I agree. And I, 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 I for one, um, am kind of interested in like, t like my huge thing that I've always been interested in time is time in physics. Mm -hmm. And like, I think quantum computers are going to be fundamental for us to understand that with the measurement problem with time in that black box of information. I mean, like you have to have time steps in quantum computing and like that means something physically. Like we don't know what yet. Like we don't know exactly how I, well, I mean, probably we have a good idea, but like we don't know exactly how the time steps are supposed to work because right now we work on auxiliary qubits trying to like tap into the, you know, the, the, um, the qubits that are doing the processes and things. So there's a lot of heavy information still to be learned about that black box of information. And that's like, Again, like we said, those are the exciting questions. Those are the things that like, you know, that make us want to like grab books and start reading. Um, so, I mean, that's 
that's why the cost is so high. I think it's because we're asking those type of questions. But yeah, um, absolutely. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? This is from Angel. Oh, my favorite ice cream flavor is mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip, classic. I knew that one right off the bat. Yep. Do you like the? Do you watch The Office? Do you like The Office? <sighs> no. No. <laughs> Uh, with the, you don't like it or you didn't watch it? <laughs> I mean, it's one of those shows where, like, I tried to watch it. I got, like, you know, a handful of episodes in, and I'm like, why is this funny? I don't know what's wrong with me. I know well. everyone thinks it's hilarious, but I watch it and I'm just like, ooh, cringe, ooh, pain. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that, like, you kind of have to be able to withstand some uh, some level of cringe. I'm bad at cringe. I don't know. Cringe That's comedy is rough. Problem. I, That's I, on I, me. I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Um, Haney asks, so is part of your job going to shows like this? <laughs> hey, okay, Haney, I feel judged by this question. Um, no, okay. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm doing this. Well, uh, the next part of the question is, is rough. Um, so is your, <laughs> so is part of your job going to shows like this or CNN? <laughs> uh, neither, <laughs> neither CNN nor IBM pays me to go on <laughs> podcasts or yeah, CNN. <laughs> I like how like, I'm like, so what do you do? Are you, you sticking with this garbage or, or are you doing bigger things like CNN? <laughs> I don't go on CNN now. I'm not at that level yet. <laughs> CNN hasn't called for a quantum communicator, but when they well, do, they I will, will be after ready. this. Okay, <laughs> small CNN, stepping stone. <laughs> um, excellent. Uh, so, Cry's next question is, uh, where? Okay, sorry. Um, where? Oh, where is your impact the greatest? Um, I think we kind of, oh, okay. So where is your impact the greatest? Is it, des and I guess this is more of a research question. Is it design, building, or operating the quantum computer at your, at your lab? I'd say building probably. I'm not awesome. designing a ton of stuff right now. And we haven't really gotten to the measurement stuff yet. Cause we're still <laughs> doing a lot of the building. So I'm going to go with building. I see. Um, the next question is really bad. Um, are you friends with Popeye? I assuming cause of Olive. But oh. I, I, I'm just gonna. We're, we won't Sick. even mention the name. Yeah, I, I'm just. I'm sorry. Um, Haney asks, <laughs> will quantum computing make testing unnecessary for chemistry, uh, or certain so. quantum ideas? Oh, could you? Okay, so I have thought the same thing, um, but for quantum field theory, right? Oh, okay. If you can, because I'm in quantum field theory and quantum computing, right? So if you can mm -hmm. model, if you can understand an interaction of a known, of a quantum computer. Like you have a quantum computer, you make, you you do all the Feynman diagrams for the interactions between the potentials and the model. Uh, and then like you can learn the interactions. Can you then extrapolate a new type of interaction out of a quantum computer by like changing? So basically I'd be like, okay, so now I'm wondering if I wanted, you know, this type of interaction, could you come up with the materials that would you know would get that so basically it's like can you answer co condensed matter chemistry questions mm -hmm. about interactions about structures based off of of knowledge that we can gain from other quantum computer systems probably yes but you know that's not a, a fully confident answer but i would say more likely yes than no I was but, just you know, curious. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious too. I mean, I think we're going to be able to simulate chemical interactions right? and right. different sorts of material processes that you would want to study for condensed matter and, you know, material science related purposes. Um, awesome. I don't know quantum field theory though, so I don't feel comfortable talking about that specifically. Eh, it's all the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, excellent. Uh, so a uh, question from 1001. Uh, is doing quantum computing something like doing electronics with regular gates, um, except that it's quantum? So do you feel that? Do you feel like it's like regular programming, except now instead of having a regular pro a regular gate, you have this thing? Yeah, I mean, it's similar. There's certainly, you know, not exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence, but there is some a there is some overlap there like <laughs> they'll use not gates and gates you know there's a quantum equivalent of those classical gates so yeah cool okay uh and i i i there is like a lot of 
um, when you're first learning quantum computing, there is a lot of drawing analogy to con mm -hmm. uh, to computer science and like the gates in computer science. Unfortunately, like I didn't know any of that <laughs> computer science stuff, so it was hard if, if everyone's like, "Oh, right. it's like it was this." It was never helpful for me when people were like, "Oh, it's like an AND gate." I'm like, eh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, "Okay, thanks. This is super just, helpful." <laughs> just make a table. Just make a table. Yeah. <laughs> a truth table. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Oh. And then they look at you and they're like, why didn't you take electronics? Class? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. I wanted to study astronomy. I'm sorry. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so uh, non-dairy neutrino NC uh, asks, could a quantum computer simulate itself? What about simulating itself, simulating itself recursively all the way down? Turtles all the way down. Turtles all the way down. I mean, I will say this question reminds me of uh, a Feynman quote. Uh, you're probably familiar with his there's plenty of room at the bottom speech um which i guess for people in the chat yeah so he gave this speech at um a conference i think you know maybe in the 60s i think it was where he said you know we need people working at like the nano level yeah. in terms of physics and he was the one who sort of first presented quantum computing as an idea that didn't make people immediately laugh because it was Feynman. So they were like, oh, he's smart. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. Um, and he suggested that quantum computers, because they are quantum, <laughs> can be used as quantum emulators. So like classical computers are really bad at simulating quantum physics because they don't rely on quantum physics. But quantum computers are good at simulating quantum physics because they are quantum physics. So in a way, it's sort of doing what, what you suggested in, in a more... Uh, humorous way <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay cool we have three questions left and uh i saw dr topher uh paging dr topher are you here um i wanted to start the game around nine because i have no idea how long it's gonna take so um ah, ah chris hi chris okay so um we'll get that set up in just a minute but let's uh bang through these last three questions i closed the queue um so if there are more questions i know people are are asking questions in chat um and i uh, I apologize if we missed it, um, but um, yeah, you can always ask me and I will happily say, I don't know. But anyways, um, <laughs> I might know. Um, commentator asks, <laughs> Come on. would you rather eat ice cream or be on this podcast? This is not a podcast. This but is like, a collaboration. Please, people. <laughs> but, like, those aren't mutually exclusive things. I could eat ice cream and be on this show right now. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Best answer. Best answer to the worst question. Okay, next one. Haney says, <laughs> um, is a working quantum computer a problem for any current industry? So any of the big people that are working on it. I mean, like, I know it's a working problem. I mean, like, so we're trying to build better ones. But I mean, yeah. like, say... Trying to think of a company that doesn't already have one. Um, uh, uh, okay, anything owned by um, Elon there. Right. Um, could he just... Is there enough on it now where he could just go and build one? That's not cutting edge, but just go and build one that works. No, I don't think so. I don't think we're at that point either. I think he would have to have a big team. I think they would spend many months. They'd have to do a lot of research. It would take so long yeah. for him to start like a quantum computing company unless he just like bought <laughs> out a startup or something uh you don't like you really need super specialized people working on that right now it's not like you can just hire like there are so many more computer scientists in the world than there are quantum computing scientists right now like it's just not that many people <laughs> True. True. and most of them are already <laughs> working at other companies yeah um, I feel like I feel like the one thing that I do. I see. I was working on on weird statistics. I was working on these parastatistics, which are like um, so you have boson statistics and fermion statistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working on one that's like uh, an arbitrary statistics. So it's like a different form of those, where it's like more generalized. I was applying that to astroparticle physics and dark matter, which is not highly marketable, right? Um, yeah. I loved it. But it's not highly marketable. Now I'm in quantum computing, and I feel like a lot safer for the job industry. Much higher, highly marketable. Yeah, much higher. So I, I that's it was a lot. It was a big. It was a bummer to change projects. That was a huge like bummer. But at the same time, um, I there's there was there was good things. Um, so you might have a job at the end of it now. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> I don't want to say it like that, but yeah, yeah. it's a hundred percent true. <laughs> um, and then a uh, commentator asks, uh, do you know much about D-wave quantum computing? 
Yes, I know a fair bit about D-Wave. Um, Excellent. Thing. Very good. We can move on. To the next. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> um, so it's a. I. I maybe maybe explain this one thing. It's a quantum annealer. It's a quantum annealer. What's yeah. that mean? So annealing is uh, a way of slowly <laughs> measuring things. From what I understand, over a slow period of time, so that you can keep track of the state and it doesn't really fully evolve in that black box type of process that you were talking about before. From what I understand, that's how okay. annealing works. Is it more like maybe probabilistic? And less, uh, like classically probabilistic instead of quantum? quantum yes, yeah, that okay. is my understanding of it. So same, it's not same as me, yeah. really, uh, a lot of people debate, it's a little controversial Say whether it. it's truel, truly a quantum. Say it, theory. there it is, there it is. But gonna, there's a we're lot start of... A, uh, we're going to start a war between companies here, Olivia. No, there's a lot of <laughs> excellent scientists at D-Wave who are doing really cool work. But, you know, there's also some really, really smart people who are doing the processes that D-Wave is claiming to compute on yeah. their laptop. Yeah. So, you know, what advantage is that really providing you if you can do it on your laptop anyway? Right. Uh, and and this, is, this is not like... This is... I, I feel like this is a more common opinion um of what d-wave is and it's it it does tell us things it's really great for educational purposes yeah. and, and for things like that but there um but i agree i think there's like this there's a benefit to that having stuff that's like more uh i don't know maybe more it's like just its own thing it yeah it's just like be like put readily in like a available different category yeah. mm -hmm. um cool uh <laughs> okay next up um Oh, we do have one question that came in after I closed the queue that I thought we might be able to hit really quickly, um, and then we would have hit everything, which I'll feel, which is which is awesome, because uh, there's a lot of questions, but you you answered them quickly and very very well. So, uh, do you think the way we think about how we will use quantum computers is similar to someone in the '60s? So, I guess mainly like we you talked about a little earlier about the things we don't know what we're going to be able to do with it. How uh, parallel do you think our experience will be? to our brand new technology of computers to now yeah. what is currently our brand new technology of quantum computing. So I really, I don't see a lot of parallels personally. Like I see the evolution at the beginning of the field being very similar, which is why I think a lot of people like to say like, oh, it's gonna follow the same trajectory, but I think it will diverge pretty significantly at a very soon, at a very uh, soon point in time, close point in time, close point in time. Um, I really don't see it being like classical computers. I saw someone wrote, you know, in, in the chat that IBM had this funny quote, like, I think, you know, they said, we would probably only need like two mainframes ever. Um, I don't think quantum computing <laughs> is gonna follow those lines because yeah. like I said, the number of problems that quantum computing is good for is just small yeah. that we know of right now. Unless somebody, you know, proves to me that you can run algorithms for video games, you know, exponentially faster on a quantum computer, I'd be like, well, maybe then, <laughs> video games, but I haven't seen anybody working on that. True. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excellent. So that concludes our Q and a, uh, thank you so much, Olivia for that. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, no problem. Those great questions and great answers. Anyways, thank you so much, Olivia, for joining me on uh, on the, the program tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. And uh, everybody, can we get some hearts in chat for um, Olivia? Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for being here. You, uh, you guys asked wonderful questions. Um, and I hope that many of you walk away inspired because this was a fantastic... Um, <laughs> a fantastic evening of conversation Q and A. Uh, but uh, Olivia, any last thoughts before you go? Any last thoughts for the community? Oh man, I always feel pressured when people put me on the spot at the very end like this. Um, you know, I, I would say if you're interested in quantum computing, if you're interested in quantum information, there's like plenty of free sources online to get started. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you don't need any type of like formal learnings, but you can get started right away and see if you're interested in it. You can always feel free to ask me questions. I'm on the internet literally hundred percent of the time. So you know, feel free to reach out and you know, it's hard, but it's hard for everybody. So stick with it. If it's something that you care about. Awesome. Um, I'm going to put, uh, really quickly, I'm going to put Olivia's 
um, Twitter handle in chat. Make sure you go give Olivia a follow on Twitter. Also follow the YouTube Kiss Kit if you'd like to see more of Olivia in a professional setting doing science communication. <laughs> a little bit more professional yeah. <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. I, I learned a lot and I'm sure chat did and I appreciate it. Um, we are going to cut it. Remember, everybody, that tomorrow we do have the physics game show happening. We're going to start up stream at 1 p.m. starting with a little quantum computing uh, a discussion series going over some. I don't know. I don't even know where we're at now, to be honest with you. Um, whatever comes after eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So we're going to be there. Oh, and we just got a raid. That's high sight queen. Uh, <laughs> unfortunate timing. Um, but thank you so much for the raid, sight queen. Uh <coughs> um, this VOD of the conversation will be available both on the channel immediately following the program and on YouTube later this week. So please be sure to check that out. Uh, and remember, we do have some fireworks streams happening this week on Thursday and Sunday. So check into those as well. Um, but again, thank you, Olivia. Everybody, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for the raid. Go follow Site Queen. Thank you for the shout out, Chris. Uh, go follow Site Queen. Um, and we will see you tomorrow. Uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much. Farewell, everybody. <laughs> All right.